Okay, well, thank yeah, you, fine. thank you, Andre. Uh, great to be back here. In fact, I was at the KITP uh, before. It was the KITP. It was the ITP. So, <laughs> so I'm by no means uh, uh, new here. All right. So this is work with Avish Patel, How you go and Ilya Estelis, uh, which was published recently. And I'll also uh, talk about, if I have time, towards the end, more recent work with several other collaborators. All right. So as the title says, it's all about spatial randomness to get strange metal behavior. So let me just begin by, you know, why, why do we think spatial disorder is really ultimately very important for a theory of strange metals uh, as, at low temperatures? At high temperatures, uh, you know, may have bad metal behavior with very large resistivity, it may not be as important. But at low temperatures, we believe it's crucial. Uh, and really, being in Cone Hall, it's good to begin with Cone's theorem. Uh, which is really the fundamental thing that's behind uh, this claim. Uh, so what Cohn showed was that uh, in the absence of uh, umklap and impurities, uh, the Fermi liquid is a perfect metal, meaning the conductivity sigma in a magnetic field uh, is just a pure delta function at the cyclotron frequency, and the cyclotron frequency is just given by uh, the bare fermion mass. It doesn't get renormalized by uh, interactions. Now, this was strictly shown for a Galilean invariant system. Uh, but as we are going to consider long wavelength lake interactions, which only act near the Fermi surface, so if you're just looking at uh, effects right near the Fermi surface, whether the system is Galilean invariant or not uh, at the bottom of the band is not that crucial. So as a result, uh, Cohn's theorem actually applies uh, even in systems uh, even in non-Fermi liquids, not just in Fermi liquids. So, so let me just illustrate those results uh, for a very simple example of a quantum critical point and a non-Fermi liquid. So say you have an Ising pneumatic critical point where the Fermi surface as a function of some parameter uh, goes from square-like symmetry to an Ising order parameter with two possible uh, rectangular shapes. So this is since it's an Ising order parameter, at finite temperature, you expect an Ising phase transition uh, where the symmetry is restored. Uh, and this transition would be described by the classical Ising model at finite temperature. So the first naive guess would be that the quantum critical point is just an Ising model in two plus one dimensions. But as you all know, that's not correct uh, because we also have to worry about the Fermi surface. And a lot has effort has been expended to understand this critical point. Uh, and it has been correctly understood that it's a strongly coupled non-Fermi liquid. There's a sharp Fermi surface, which is sharp uh, in momentum space, although not in energy space. And so even though there's a Fermi surface, there are no quasi-particles. The, the excitations are very broad in energy. Uh, and so this is a pretty well-established non-Fermi liquid state. But the question really is what happens to the non-Fermi liquid at finite temperature? Uh, is it a strange metal uh, with strange transport properties? And, and the answer is right that the theory as described is actually a perfect metal uh, in the sense of cone. So, so let me quickly review some of the, and the, the basic argument is what I just said. Uh, even though the system is not Galen invariant, since it's dominated by long wavelength fluctuations of phi, uh, it may as well be Galen invariant. Yes. I guess, right? That's what long wavelength, right. So all long wave phenomena only, okay. Right, now if you put an umclap, that leads to some non-critical renormalization of the electron mass, but doesn't give you any singular behavior. Or just the mass changes, that's it. That's it, pretty much, yeah. Okay, so here's the field theory we begin with. We have a Fermi surface with some interactions and various form factors I've neglected. So what we do is we decouple it into a scalar field phi, uh, which is, has a Jukawa coupling to some appropriate fermion order parameter. This is not the density. I'm just saving some space by not writing down form factors. Uh, okay, so now you can study this theory uh, and uh, in some kind of Elias book like uh, self-consistent approach, where sigma is the fermion Green's function, self-energy, and pi is the boson self-energy. Uh, and this was in a slightly different problem I think Patrick Lee was the first to point out that the self-energy goes as omega to the two-third, uh, uh, whereas the density fluctuations are diffusive, 
uh, 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 with Landau damping, strong Landau damping. Uh, and so this gives you a non Fermi liquid. So this, I believe, is essentially a correct uh, answer. There may be small corrections to the exponents, and there's also superconductivity in this particular model at low temperature, but this is basically okay. Uh, but now, what about transport? Well, uh, first, if you ask for the DC transport, if the DC transport, the point here is that there's something called uh, drag, that is, uh, the, the, since the quasi particles don't exist and the phonons, these, these scalar field phi is so strongly coupled to the Fermi surface, any momentum the, uh, the fermions give to the bosons comes back to the, can come back to the fermions. And really there's no distinction between the two. The whole system is just some strongly interacting system which has extreme drag. So in this sense, it's very different from electrons and phonons because phonons are weakly coupled and then phonons can lose their and because they're so weakly coupled, they have plenty of time to lose their momentum uh, to impurities. But here, you're in the extreme strong coupling limit, and so basically the conductivity is infinite. Uh, but somewhat more surprisingly, but maybe not in retrospect, uh, there's also a similar result for the optical conductivity. So here there was a claim that uh, by looking at these graphs uh, by, by these people that there's an uh, infrared omega to the minus two-third optical conductivity at zero temperature with some constant C. Now they identified all the correct graphs. They just didn't evaluate the number C. If they had bothered to evaluate the number C, uh, they would have seen that it's actually zero. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is just Cohn's theorem in action. Uh, this has also been done in the presence of a magnetic field in recent work by Hayu. And uh, uh, you find then that you just basically have the cone-like response uh, due to, uh, in the absence of any impurities in this type of long wavelength field theory uh, with this scalar field becoming critical at the quantum critical point. Yes? You were talking about strong coupling versus weak coupling. Does, yeah. Does this mean if you move away from the quantum critical fan, then uh, it will no longer be a, a perfect metal? Well, it'll just become a Fermi liquid. Right, uh, yeah, then. Uh, it'll have various Fermi liquid to normalization, and Fermi liquid is also a perfect metal, right. strictly speaking. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have to put in disorder, and so let's, let me discuss how, the, how that works. So let's take the same theory uh, of a scalar field coupled to a Fermi surface and add in some random potential. So this is what you do in the theory of disordered metals. Uh, and you have this very successful and beautiful theory uh, where you have you know, these Altula Aronoff type corrections uh, to the conductivity of a disordered Fermi liquid. So there, uh, Fermi liquid behavior uh, survives. So now you can ask, well, what is the effect of this potential uh, to, 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 to this quantum critical point? So basically, you put in this random potential and then you go through the same analysis that I outlined, uh, that's exactly the elias berg type equations that Patrick Lee had looked at. Uh, and what you find then, the self-energy of the fermions, instead of being uh, 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 omega to the two-third, has two contributions. One is the usual Drude lifetime, which is independent of frequency. And the other is this marginal Fermi liquid correction. So this comes from the fact that uh, the, the, the scalar propagator is diffusive at the quantum critical point, and you just put that in, and you get a marginal Fermi liquid behavior uh, in the electron self energy. Um, and this is actually implicit in the famous paper of Halpern, Lee, and Reed, who we were looking at a slightly different problem, but they did consider the, the, the fact that when you have impurities, the boson becomes diffusive and its consequences. All right, but the. <laughs> But now you can now try to compute transport. So you go back and compute exactly the same diagrams, and you find that this cancellation, Cohn's cancellation still kind of happens. There's a remnant of it. Uh, and so even though the self-energy is a margin Fermi liquid, the conductivity is just like a Fermi liquid. It's got only the elastic scattering piece, uh, and the self-energy doesn't feed into any transport properties, at least at this order of calculation. Uh, in, in this kind of self-consistent uh, Slomas of Larkin, Margie Thompson type diagrams. Okay, uh, so, so that's the conclusion. Fermi surface 
coupled to critical boson with no disorder is a non-Fermi liquid, but no strange metal transport. With potential disorder, you get a marginal Fermi liquid in the self-energy anyway, but no strange metal transport. So what's the, what's the answer? The answer is interaction disorder. So let me motivate this, for example, by this experiment uh, on the cuprates. Uh, this is STM, the so-called STM gap map. And we're all very familiar that the gap uh, has a variance as large as the mean. Uh, and so there's very strong interactions uh, at play here. Whether these are induced by impurities or self-induced is a separate question. But let's, you know, it's clear that they're there. Um, Okay, so, and what is this, what is the source of this interaction, of this disorder? Uh, well, the one way to think about it, we, we are accustomed to putting in disorder in, in various, as a random potential, or in the hopping or on-site energies, as in the Anderson model. Uh, but now we have a strongly coupled system, uh, and this disorder in the hopping will lead into disorder in the exchange interaction, via this famous relation, J is T squared over U. So you really have to have, allow for, disorder in J. Uh, and this is not something perturbation theory was going to give you, because you see this is non-perturbative used in the denominator. So of course, if you could solve the problem exactly, we could just put in disorder in Tij and, and, and just solve it. But since we are only doing uh, looking into interaction perturbatively, we have to put it in by cells, ourselves by hand. I mean, there's some kind of, we're doing some RG, and the RG is generating Disorder in JIJ. Shubir, could I make a quick comment? In the pure Anderson model, without an interaction, whether you put the disorder in the on site energy or the hopping energy makes no difference. Exactly. Just, same agree. result, exactly the same result. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. But, but here, because of exchange, this J, it will make a difference, is what you're saying. Well, I mean, ultimately, it doesn't. I mean, if you solve the problem exactly, you can put it anywhere and be done with it. But since we're going to solve it in this self consistent low order calculation, uh, we really have to be more active and put it in, in just the right places to begin with. Okay, so we put in this order in V, so let's put in this order in J. So I'll add a small random J prime. And now it turns out, uh, for various technical reasons, it's much nicer to just rescale phi and put the disorder in this term over here. Uh, so we just rescale phi, and so now your Yukawa coupling G um, has, in this case, a correction G prime, uh, which is spatially random. Uh, so there's two sources of disorder in blue, the V and the G prime, and we just take them to be Gaussian random fields, which are delta correlated in space. Okay, so now you just turn the same crank on this simple theory, uh, and, uh, and what do you get? Well, you get everything you want, really. Uh, so first of all, just as you had with random V, you get a marginal Fermi liquid behavior uh, in the uh, electron self-energy. Uh, there's two contributions to the marginal Fermi liquid self-energy. There's the G squared or V squared we had before, and there's also a G prime squared. Uh, all the coefficients uh, have put equal to one. That's just for purposes of this talk. Uh, all right. However, when you compute the uh, conductivity, uh, so you get a very nice set of results. Uh, so the Green's function, as I told you, has an inelastic scattering rate, comes from both uh, G and G prime. G is the spatially uniform, G prime is the spatially uh, random component. But when you look at the transport property as it, say, feeds into the conductivity, uh, well, th this is the usual Druder term, V squared, but the G prime now gives you a mod omega at zero temperature, and something that's linear in temperature uh, at finite temperature. And correspondingly, in the optical mass, uh, there's a logarithmic frequency dependence. Okay, so that's really, that's really it. Uh, uh, you just calculate in this theory with a random G prime. The G cancels out in the transport, but the G prime doesn't. Uh, and to, you know, perturbatively, this is really, uh, <coughs> You can see this explicitly, and that's what's in the recent paper that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. All right, so <clears throat> I'm doing well. Okay, I have plenty of time. Uh, so let me summarize all the observable properties that you get. Uh, at this point, these are qualitative behaviors which are largely consistent with uh, observations, it seems. 
we have to make it more quantitative. Uh, you know, we haven't done that, so let's see. That will be the real test. I mean, of course, the biggest question at this point is what is the magnitude of G prime, and can you find a way to compute it? Uh, we're thinking about it, but I don't, I don't really have a good way to do it at this, this point. So for now, we just treat G prime as some phenomenological parameter. So the resistivity has a residual resistivity given by V squared uh, and a linear and T term that's given by G prime squared. Uh, the optical conductivity has, uh, has a transport scattering rate, which has omega over T scaling, and consequently by Kramer's Kronig, uh, and its linear and frequency or temperature. And by Kramer's Kronig, the, the effective uh, mass has a logarithmic correction. Now, quite coincidentally, uh, at just about the same time as we were putting our paper out, there was this paper by Michaud et al., Re-examining uh, the older data of uh, Dirk Warner Merrill, Dirk here, uh, coming and really coming up with the, uh, essentially the, exactly the same scaling form that comes out of our theory, with the same power laws and log corrections and so on. This is the data on the Q on YBCO. Uh, the photo emission, like I said, uh, is a marginal Fermi liquid form. Uh, so Dan Dassau has photo emission data where he fits it to this type of scaling form, alpha equals, and he finds that alpha that's doping dependent. Uh, we don't, we find alpha is one half, uh, and he has alpha around one half near optimal doping. Uh, and this marginal Fermi liquid self energy does give you T log T specific heat, uh, has, uh, for example, Hartnell and McKinsey have uh, <coughs> looked at in the RMP. So continuing, we are now looking at many other properties, and I'll just quickly flash what we are looking at. Some of, uh, five minutes left. Okay, there's this cyclotron resonance in the G prime model uh, has some dependence on the strength of interaction. Uh, there's short noise. You get a suppression of the short noise Fano factor from uh, one sixth to one third. Uh, and I think maybe Doug Nadelson will say something about his experiments on short noise later. Uh, we are working with Jörg Schmalin and his group and Davide Valentinis on magnetotransport and Hall effect. Uh, we are optimistic that's gonna work, but not, not clear. We're looking at nonlinear optics, one of my students, Sergey. Uh, onset of superconductivity, uh, thermoelectric response, and also density fluctuation is something that Banjan uh, has been studying. Anyway, so there's a lot of work here and hopefully uh, eventually there'll be some kind of quantitative uh, confrontation between theory and experiment. We're not there yet, but uh, I'm optimistic. This simple model can at least uh, lead to some starting of an understanding of what a strange metal is. Okay, uh, so how would I apply this to the cuprates? Well, I don't think the cuprates have any auto parameter associated with the broken symmetry that's controlling the strange metal. Instead, what I believe in the cuprates is that there is a strange metal between uh, a pseudo gap metal state, uh, which has a sort of a violation of the, of the Lutinger theorem and therefore spin liquid behavior to an ordinary Fermi metal. Uh, and you can describe this transition using a slave boson type theory, uh, where the slave boson phi, uh, or a Higgs boson more probably in this case, uh, they plays the role of the little phi that I was talking about. So everything I said in the random case uh, goes over uh, also to this kind of Fermi volume changing transition, which doesn't have any symmetry break. Okay, time. All right. So in the last two minutes, this is not work done by me. Uh, this is work led by Avishkar Patel, uh, and Peter Luntz, and Michael Albergo at Flatiron. So they're taking this simple model that I just wrote down. And everything I've said is based upon some kind of large N, Alyashkog, SYK, depth analysis of this model. So really have to ask, you know, how accurate is that? We don't know. So, so one way you can test this is do quantum Monte Carlo. So just five minutes before my talk, they mailed me their slides. So I'm showing you this work. I'm not part of this work, but I, I'm pretty excited about what they're seeing. So they're looking at, uh, basically the usual uh, uh, spin fermion model. Uh, you have fermions coupled to some scalar field phi. Uh, in this case, they're taking the spin density wave autoparameter. So it's a finite momentum Q 
uh, and the coupling between phi, uh, I can't even hear, there's the G prime, which is a Gaussian random coupling. So they develop very sophisticated uh, numerical techniques to take this to very large system sizes. Uh, and uh, this is how they identify the critical point. Uh, and the basic point is that if you look at the boson propagator, it has this diffusive linear and omega behavior, one over Q squared plus uh, uh, mod omega. This is, the, I think, the Q dependence. And I haven't even touched. And this is the omega dependence. And if you look at the self-energy, uh, it fits the omega log omega extremely well. Now, if you go to strong coupling, they even start to see signs of superconductivity. So that seems to be the first deviation from the large end theory. The large end theory worked extremely well, but at low temperature, it starts deviating. And the, the cause of the deviation is actually onset of superconductivity. Oh, OK, thank you. <laughs> So questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are a couple of mics. <coughs> See you over there. Go ahead. So we are real quick question. Hi. Doug. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi Doug. Um, is there, I mean, maybe this is latent in here and I just didn't pick it up. Is there anything kind of um, analogous to sort of Altshuler Aronoff corrections to the density of states from having the? Um, yeah, so I know that <laughs> Matt Foster has been thinking about that. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think so. No, I think the Altshuler-Ronoff approach uh, is based upon perturbing from a Fermi liquid. Even though you know marginal Fermi liquid is very far from a Fermi liquid, you get it's that's you know it's all, the word marginal. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> word marginal suggests that it's very close to a Fermi liquid, but no the. The imaginary part of self energy is going from omega squared to omega. Uh, so I don't think those corrections are there. Uh, I mean, there are one over n corrections. They're probably buried in, those graphs are buried in many other effects that come out of one over n. Uh, and, and in the, your colleagues' results, uh, many, they do a somewhat different approach. Uh, they actually get a divergent correction, uh, which diverges at one over temperature. From the uh, from the from the leading order result uh, when they include those graphs and the, the divergent correction tells you that you know you have to resum the perturbations you're not doing it in the right way sorry he should be here to defend himself but okay since you asked <laughs> that's my opinion <laughs> can I continue on the same line <laughs> Go ahead. so um, about same I'll show you our own of the yes case. yes so there is a ballistic limit of this. Which is known uh, as Zala Abnarozny Aligner. Okay. And what you have, you start with the Fermi liquid, the simplest one, let's say just Hubbard interaction. You add short range impurities and you cross diagrams. Okay. Once you cross, sorry, lines. Once you, once you cross the wavy lines and dashed lines, you get a marginal Fermi liquid. And you have linear NT of resistivity and you have one over T or whole effect. How is it different from what you have in your uh, potential? Uh, a disorder part of the model. Sorry, what is, what, you take the clean limit, you're looking at. We take a clean limit, yes. but we now cross impurity lines yeah. and wavy lines. And right. wavy line is just hover. Right. You get marginal Fermi liquid. But there the temperature has to be much bigger than. Uh, one so, tau. Uh, one tau. Yeah, so here definitely temperature is much lower than that. Uh, we are at down to zero temperature. Right. This is, then yeah. you go to the, to the diffusive limit and you still get the marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, okay, <laughs> but I mean, uh, so I just wanted to see the uh, correspondence between your, let's say, T in the resistivity and T in the resistivity. I mean, for us, you're required to have this massless scalar associated either with a topological phase transition or a symmetry breaking transition. Okay, so uh, if you move away from uh, the quantum critical point, you wouldn't get T. No, yeah, it would. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have ideas about why T linear resistivity persists above the Fermi temperature? Sorry? Do you have ideas Who about why I'm here? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, so that's the bad metal regime. There's many other ideas on that. You can take uh, various DMFT theories. You have even SYK lattice models that give you linear resistivity at, at higher temperatures. I think the mystery is why the slope doesn't change very much. Yeah, so uh, I know Avishka has been thinking about that. I don't have a good answer to that question. 
Uh, is there any way of getting around alpha equals one half in your theory? Not in this theory, no. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a Mott insulator sitting around there. What role does the proximity to Mottness play in your theory? Okay, so great. <laughs> uh, so in the in the, uh, I, the the theory I presented in the first part, uh, which was the uh, uh, Ising pneumatic transition, it plays no role. But in this theory that I that I believe applies to the cuprates, uh, this FL star state, the pseudo gap state, and the spin liquid is very much a remnant of the Mott insulator. So but this is metal has nothing to do with that. Sorry, let me finish, let me finish. So this, so we have worked out a theory for this phase transition. I didn't present it to you. When you do a theory of this transition from FL star to FL, uh, everything I told you for the other transition applies in the disordered case. It's, it's essentially universal. All the details don't matter. Uh, whether it's a symmetry breaking transition at Q equals zero, a symmetry breaking transition at finite Q, like the spin density wave, or this kind of, uh, proximity to Mott's insular transition, they have the same behavior as far as all the corrections I talked about. Okay, so you have a question now? A number of questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I had a question about uh, also the FL to FL star transition. Yeah. So there usually, if I think about the condo breakdown picture, yes. um, you have a conduction Fermi surface and yeah. you have a spin on Fermi surface. Yeah. But these Fermi surfaces, when they don't match in shape, yeah. then the scattering that you need to, the, the boson scattering that you need to mediate between scattering right. would need to be a large momentum. So in that case, would the theory still apply, or does it only apply to the case of matching okay. Fermi surfaces? This is the best question so far. Uh, okay, good. Uh, yes, uh, so the point is that, first of all, in this case, uh, the, uh, it's not quite a condo lattice, it's a single band model. Uh, but there is what we call a ghost Fermi surface. So there is analog of a spin on Fermi surface. And yes. right, in the clean limit, they would have to match to have some singular behavior in the electron transport. But in the presence of disorder, there's no such requirement. Once G prime, the coupling, uh, the coupling between the boson and the fermion becomes spatially random, then as long as it's random enough to make the Fermi surface fuzzy, it doesn't matter. So in fact, in this case, in this corner of Monte Carlo, you know, this is a theory that has hot spots in the clean limit. But once you make G prime random, its behavior is indistinguishable from a theory without hot spots. It doesn't matter. So the randomness really is the key that helps you, helps make this so universal. It doesn't, all of these things that are so important for the clean limit don't make a difference. Can I ask a follow up or is there too, too many other hands? <laughs> So we're just making sure this is uh, all when there is a quantum critical point, and you know there is a quantum critical point, right? Well, I mean, there could be, a, like, for example, in the cuprates, uh, I'm not saying there's a quantum critical point. There is an underlying critical point, which in this case is hidden by superconductivity. It could be, you know, it could be even just kind of metastable. But, but yes, okay. in I our theory, in our minds, there's a quantum critical okay. point. I just wanted to make sure. That's what I thought. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, super beautiful talk. Sorry? I have a beautiful talk. Thank you. I have a question about uh, the fact that your linear resistivity has a coefficient that depends very sensitively on disorder. Yes. Whereas phenomenologically, that seems absolutely not to be the case. Okay. And well, we can discuss so, uh, yes, we can discuss. So, let me, I'll say I have a couple, two answers to that. One, there's plenty of experiments where it is the case. It just depends. I mean, I, we have references. There are, there's some experiment by Alul, which is not the case, but there's many others where it is the case that the slope changes when you change the degree of disorder. Uh, so my guess is it has to do with long wavelength versus short wavelength disorder. The short wavelength disorder is probably important for the residual resistivity, whereas the long wavelength is more responsible for the slope. The other answer is that if you look at these STM data, uh, which look very disordered, this disorder is much stronger than the impurities. They know exactly where the impurities are, and that can't explain the disorder they see. So it may well be that this is a, there's some self-generation of disorder, that every system, you know, at low temperatures, whatever impurities they are, they pin some kind of glassy state. And so in that sense, the disorder is kind of self-generated. Okay, that's a guess, but that's, uh, that's where. We can discuss. Yes. <laughs> 
So uh, on a similar uh, topic, yes. so it seems very natural to have an interaction that's random. Yes. Um, but uh, one ha would have to have an interaction that's random and in appropriate dimensionless units, this randomness in the interaction be larger than the one that's the potential scattering. That's to some extent what's surprising. In, uh, in, the, in our large end theory. Now, of course, one will generate the other in a complete theory, correct. which we don't have. <laughs> yeah, but even uh, uh, microscopically or chemically, if you mm -hmm. want so, do you have an intuition why the potential scattering of that randomness is comparatively weak if I look at the mean free paths at very low temperatures in YBCO? Well, I, I, I yeah, good question. <laughs> uh, I think I would say the same thing I said to Mohit. I don't think any more interesting one doesn't to say. Uh, it may be that the point like impurities which dominate the V term are, are really quite weak. Uh, but this kind of more longer wavelength nanoscale self-generated disorder is what's determining G prime. <laughs> uh, there are two questions in Zoom from Chandra. I will try to formulate them uh, in a short way. So the first one is um, you have a large Fermi surface. Uh, why don't you have umclavs? Because the interactions are all long wavelength. That's what I thought. Uh, and second one, how do you get the wave superconductivity if your normal state self-energy is independent of the momentum? Uh, okay, so the more this, well, okay, so there's a G and a G prime. So if you look, if you look at the effects of G more carefully, uh, that can give you D wave. The G prime doesn't, D prime also induces superconductivity, but as long as it's been singlet, it doesn't care. But the G will care. Uh, or, well, you know, it depends on the shape of the Fermi surface and we'll select D over anything else. So my, my question is a little bit related to what Chandra was asking and, and that's about umklop and the, how interactions can appear in the mass as mm -hmm. far as the transport is concerned. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, and, and Shankar also had asked uh, this. So how do we know that critical boson plus Fermi surface plus umklop, right. there's not a feedback effect that allows it to appear in the resistivity? It seems like that would be very natural, and it would also, this is similar to what? Well, yeah, so there have been various proposals on right. the effects of umclop. Yeah. They, they all seem to require some kind of fine tuning where the umclop has to be really acting at small, small momenta. Maybe in some cases you can make it work, but I think this is a much more robust mechanism. What I thought you were going to ask was about the cyclotron mass. So umclop interactions can induce well, normalization of mass or, or transport in general. I mean, the mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but they, you don't expect them to be so strongly doping dependent. Uh, umclop is basically short wave, short field with interactions, which uh, uh, should are, are not singular. They're just the same everywhere. So as long as it won't give you any singular temperature or doping dependence. Okay, uh, very quickly, yes. Quick question. Uh, so does the coefficient of the T-linear resistance uh, have anything to do or uh, have any connection with uh, Planckian bound? Uh, or is it subject yes. to the Planckian yes. bound? Right? Because uh, it looks so like it's G, G prime square. That can be any value. Right, no, no. So the, the Planckian bound, if you divide it carefully, I don't have the slide here. It's in our paper. Uh, if you define it carefully in terms of the renormalized effective mass, so the, mm -hmm. so the fact that there's a marginal Fermi liquid self energy uh, will give you, uh, will also renormalize the mass, uh, of, you know, uh, just slightly away from the critical point, which is how you measure it. So if you write the Planckian band bound in terms of the renormalized mass, then the bound is one over tau is less than G prime squared, roughly speaking. Uh, you get one over tau is, uh, less than, I think, g prime squared over g squared plus g prime squared times kt. So if it's completely random, then this number turns out to be, I think, pi over 4 or something like this uh, when g goes to 0. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that's mm -hmm. the best we have. That in, a, in a system that has only purely random interaction, it saturates the bound. Uh, when you have also uh, non-random interactions, then you'll be lower than that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, 10 seconds for question, 10 seconds for answer. Quickly, yeah, do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, just another quick question about the disorder and the random, uh, for the boson. Yeah. So g generally, you should also expect like a random mass disorder for the boson, yeah. which is very relevant. 
Um, so how does that feed back into the theory? Right. So that's that. That was exactly why I said I'm going to uh, take the random mass and convert it into a random uh, coupling. Now, now when you do that, you rescale phi. Now there's also a grad phi squared term that I didn't write, write down. So eventually, you expect it to break down. So eventually, yes, the random mass will come in and destroy this quantum critical point. But what we are finding is that by just putting into the recover coupling, it gives you a wide, very wide temperature range where you can compute things quite reliably. So the how, you know, how do we settle when the random mass is really important? Uh, well, that's one of the reasons the, I was started the quantum Monte Carlo, to see whether the random mass effects comes in. And what he's finding so far is way before that happens, uh, it becomes superconducting. So, so the most important, those are the two things we were worried about, superconductivity and, and random mass. And superconductivity turns out to be the more important perturbation to this critical point than the random mass. The very, very last question. <laughs> so I, I should have asked it when you had the, the, when you had the STM uh, data. But yes. um, it, it, it was a bit confusing because uh, it's true that the impurities, you know where they are. Yes. Uh, and uh, the disorder that you find is much stronger, but it's a gap disorder. Yeah. And, and so I'm just interpreting that. And a, a, superconducting, a superconducting state, especially with a short coherence length, is going to magnify the disorder anyway. You are going yeah. to get mesoscopic fluctuations, and you are going to get very, very strong disorder, uh, gap disorder. So, um, I so, I, I, so I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that I'm interpreting the gap disorder as due to disorder in the interaction rather than the density of states. That's my, I'm interpreting the data as telling me there's randomness in I J. Think, That's all I need it for. Okay, but I think <laughs> that for a very short coherence length superconductor like this one is... Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's been magnified, but it's there. I mean, I'm just saying uh, we have to include randomness in J, and this is some evidence that there's random J. Okay, <laughs> so. it was a great discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.